Welcome everyone. I'm Francis Hayashida. I'm the director of the Latin American and Iberian Institute. The Latin American and Iberian Institute at the University of New Mexico promotes and supports interdisciplinary teaching, research, and meaningful public engagement, advance the production and dissemination of knowledge about Latin America and Iberia. Latin America is designated a, uh, as one of seven priority areas of research for UNM, and we proudly contribute to both the university's intellectual community as well as global discourse through programming. Founded in 1889, the University of New Mexico sits on the traditional homelands of the Pueblo of Sandia. The original peoples of New Mexico, Pueblo, Navajo, and Apache, since time immemorial, have deep connections to the land and have made significant contributions to the broader community statewide. We honor the land itself and those who remain stewards of this land throughout the generations, and also acknowledge our committed relationship to indigenous peoples. We gratefully recognize our history. I'm delighted to introduce our speaker today, Tobias Fischer, who will speak on forecasting volcanic eruptions in Latin America. Professor Fischer is a volcanologist and geochemist who researches fluids discharging from active volcanoes and hydrothermal systems. He and his students also measure diffuse degassing in tectonically active areas. Um, his current field areas include volcanoes in Central and South America and the East African uh, Rift and the Canary Islands. Uh, and Prof <laughs> Professor Fisher obtained his PhD in 1999 from Arizona State University, followed by a postdoctoral position at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, working on noble gases and geothermal systems. He joined UNM in 2000 and is currently professor and director of the Volatiles Laboratory in the Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences, where his team uses mass spectrometry and gas chromatography to analyze volatiles. Thank you, Tobias, for sharing your work with us today. Yeah, thank you very much, Francis, for um, the invitation and the opportunity to talk about my research. And, um, you know, it's really nice to talk about work in um, Latin America, because that's really where I started um, studying volcanoes as a grad student. And so I have a very, uh, you know, kind of strong connection to, to people there and places and of course the volcanoes. So putting this talk together was, um, was quite nice to uh, actually go back a little bit and, uh, and see, see these things again. So <clears throat> I'm going to be talking about forecasting volcanic eruptions. And some of the talk is um, kind of general and some of it is a little bit more technical. I hope that I can um, carry everyone along without boring too many people. So let's see. Um, you know, there are about 2000 uh, Holocene volcanoes in, uh, in Latin America going from Mexico all the way to Chile. So Holocene means you know, active over the past 10,000, 11,000 years. And what I want to say to start out is that there are a lot of <clears throat> institutions in Latin America that are concerned with uh, studying these volcanoes from a scientific um, aspect, as well as of course, for the hazard aspect, right? <clears throat> so there's the Universidad Nacional Autonoma in Mexico, UNA uh, of Sicori in Costa Rica, the Instituto Nicaragüense de Estudios Territoriales, INETER in Nicaragua, <clears throat> Servicio Nacional de Minas y Geología, uh, Servicio Colombiano, Instituto Geofísico in Ecuador, and many, many more. And um, <clears throat> there are many scientists and students and technicians and engineers who, uh, what they do is they, they monitor the volcanoes and they do science to understand um, what happens uh, during, during uh, precursors of eruptions and during run-up of eruptions and then dealing with the hazards that are associated with them. So without those people that uh, work there, scientists like myself uh, would have no way of um, obtaining the data and uh, doing, doing the work, right? So everything we do is really in close collaboration with, uh, with the scientists from these uh, institutions. So, uh, you know, Latin America is a, is a big place, right? So if you look at the map on the right, we see all the triangles. 
that stretch <clears throat> from Mexico all the way down to the tip of Chile. Those are uh, all the uh, Holocene volcanoes that are uh, located in Latin America. And if you zoom in to the right side of the South American co continent, we see that there are some chains of volcanoes that go from uh, central Colombia into Ecuador. Then there's a big gap in volcanism where there's actually no, no uh, recently active volcanoes through most of Peru. And then once you get into southern Peru, Bolivia and northern Chile, you have again lots of active, active volcanoes. Then you have again a gap. And then again, you have a bunch of active volcanoes going from central Chile all the way down to the tip uh, of South America. And the reason why there are these gaps has to do um, with the way the subduction zone is working and the way magmas are supplied to these regions or not, right? So people have been studying these gaps and trying to understand them for quite some time. And it really has to do with, you know, where is the magma? And wherever there's the magma, there's going to be some volcanoes. And when there's no magma generation, there's simply no volcanoes. So the volcanoes are simply, um, you know, the surface expression of what is happening at depth. Now, uh, all of this has to do with plate tectonics. We can divide the Earth's surface up into these major plates. And relevant for us in uh, South America, Central America is the Nazca plate, the Antarctic plate, the Cocos plate, and to some extent, perhaps um, the Pacific plate. And so these plates, they move around um, at relatively slow rates compared to our human movements that are all really, really fast. But those plates, they move and uh, they uh, produce uh, seismicity. Uh, for example, that's shown here. So earthquakes that are formed by subduction of the Nazca plate. So the Nazca plate is being shoved underneath the uh, South American plate. And during that uh, subduction process, the plates essentially rub against each other and produce um, friction that's then released in earthquakes. And so earthquakes are a very, very common phenomenon. They occur all the time in these uh, subduction zones. <clears throat> and here's just showing us the number of earthquakes you know, over a certain time period and the depth of these earthquakes along the uh, Nazca plate margin on the western edge of the South American continent. And we see that, you know, the plates are uh, rubbing against each other and, and subducting. And uh, the earthquakes are quite shallow on the western edge, so where the uh, oceanic plate meets the continental plate. And then as you go further to the east, uh, the earthquakes actually get deeper and deeper. And so <clears throat> that is because we have these subducting slabs that are shoved down into the mantle. So here is an outline again of these earthquakes, the location of these earthquakes, the round dots are the earthquakes. And um, the outline shows you in the, black, uh, in the black lines, shows you more or less where we think the subducting slab is. So we see that you know, we have shallow earthquakes, to the western side, and then we have deeper and deeper earthquakes as we get to the east. And the earthquakes happen where the slab is subducting. So from that information, we know um, that uh, these plates are moving and producing earthquakes. And that is also the process that produces magma in these locations, right? So here's a very schematic diagram that shows you the same kind of cross section anywhere along a continental margin where you have a continental lithosphere. So in our case, that would be, you know, uh, South America, for example, a continental South America. And you have the oceanic lithosphere that's subducting down underneath the continental lithosphere. And the crosses are these, these earthquakes, the shallow earthquakes. And then as you go down deeper, you get these deeper earthquakes. And at some depths, there are no more earthquakes because everything is moving kind of in a ductile fashion. So the, the friction is no longer released by breaking the rocks, but the rocks just simply flow and the earthquakes that are uh, produced are just very small or, or not at all. And the important part about um, volcanoes and um, magmas is that this uh, oceanic plate <clears throat> is an oceanic plate. So it's been sitting underneath the ocean for millions of years and it's uh, soaking wet with seawater, right? So the seawater has just been absorbed by minerals in this plate. 
And as those minerals get exposed to higher and higher pressure and temperatures, as the plate descends into the mantle, water is uh, being squeezed out of those minerals and uh, rises up into the overlying mantle. And that process is a very, very important process because it actually lowers the melting point of these mantle rocks, right? And then you can get melts forming in this mantle uh, right, right where the water comes off the, off the slab. So, so this is really interesting because you're shoving down this cold plate that's been sitting on the ocean forever. And uh, you know, you're still melting rocks though. That is just because the water helps the melting of the mantle, <clears throat> of the mantle wedge. So these magmas then rise up to the surface slowly, very slowly, and uh, connect, stall in the crust at some point and form these things that, you know, we generally call magma chambers, right? And once these magmas eventually perhaps make it to the surface, they will form the volcanoes that we, that we see at the surface and that we can study. So a volcano, of course, is sitting at the surface. You can look at it, you can study it, you can sample it, you can analyze the samples, you can collect all kinds of rocks and so on. And it is the surface expression of things that happen way, way deeper down in the mantle and in fact have to do with the entire tectonic cycle because material that comes from the slab uh, gets shoved down into the mantle and part of it comes back out through, uh, through the volcanoes, right? So it, the volcanoes are in, in essence kind of like a recycling factory of stuff that originates from the oceanic plate, gets mixed with the mantle, the crust, and then you know, ends up producing rocks and, and volatiles and gases that come back out to the surface, to the atmosphere. So <clears throat> uh, now in terms of volcanic hazards, right? So volcanic hazards, they are uh, kind of unique. Um, what this plot shows us is the chance of occurrence in any given year in percent. And then you have the damage uh, fatalities. There are no dimensions on this one. But when, when we look at, um, for example, floods and droughts uh, and earthquakes, you know, they, they occur quite frequently um, per year. Uh, and, and the volcanoes don't occur as frequently generally as earthquakes and floods. But once you have these larger eruptions, right, that have a small chance of occurrence that are, um, a, that have a smaller chance of occurrence than a flood or a drought or an earthquake or a tsunami, the potential for damage and fatalities can be quite dramatic, right? So, so volcanoes are a certain hazard and um, Mount St. Helens is shown here, you know, so chance of a Mount St. Helens occurring uh, every year is about 10%. So we should have Mount St. Helens, Vesuvius style eruptions all the time. And we do, volcanoes go off around the world all the time. Uh, often we don't hear about it, because sometimes they're in remote, remote locations, or it's just like there's so many other news that we don't really pay attention to, to these eruptions. Like for example, the La Palma uh, eruption in, in the Canary Islands has been going on for almost a month now, yet you know, many people haven't even uh, you know, heard about it because it's not, it's not on your radar. So, so you know, of course, if you get to the super volcanoes like, um, um, like for example, Yellowstone or so, those are extremely rare. But if such an eruption happens, it, it would uh, produce a global catastrophe. So the potential for damage and fatalities is huge compared to floods and droughts and earthquakes. But the occurrences for those large eruptions are very small. The, the, poten the uh, uh, um, potential for, so, for such eruptions. Now, the other thing about volcanoes is that you can actually forecast them. And uh, that's again, very different from uh, other hazards. So for example, if you have a hurricane like Sandy or Katrina, the real precursor to a hurricane is maybe a few days or a few hours. Uh, likewise, for an earthquake, you essentially have no way uh, of, of forecasting them, uh, except for maybe a few hours before or a few minutes before, right? Um, 
Likewise, tsunami, we can, we can forecast the tsunami, but only by a few hours. You know, say, okay, the tsunami is going to come in a couple of hours. That's, that's pretty much what we can do. Um, flooding, we can, we can forecast much better. But volcanoes, we can uh, sometimes actually forecast for in terms of weeks to months uh, before the eruption will happen, and certainly for, for days, right? Of course, not, not every uh, unrest is going to lead to an eruption. So there are some false forecasts, right? But in general, volcanoes give some kind of signal that allows us to understand, hey, something's going to happen. And that signal usually is, you know, few few weeks perhaps or even months before the eruption will happen. So, okay, so what are some of the hazards, right? <clears throat> um, so on the left side, there's a nice diagram from the USGS. Uh, here's the magma chamber down below, right? And we just talked about how these magmas are formed in subduction zones. Then you have the magma conduit. Once that magma gets to the surface, that's where things start happening. You get the eruption column, you get ash fall, acid rain, Right, you get um, lava flows, of course, you get pyroclastic flows, you get mud flows, debris flows, um, landslides, you, you get um, fumarolic activity, gas coming out, uh, bombs flying around, uh, lava domes forming. So there's lots of things that, that are going on uh, during these uh, volcanic eruptions. And of course, it depends on the type of activity, the type of volcano, the time during an eruption. Um, <clears throat> On, in terms of what is going to happen. And one of the most challenging things to forecast, I would say, is to not just say, yeah, the volcano is going to erupt, but you know, what is it going to do? How big is the eruption going to be? When is it exactly going to start? How long is it going to last? And once it starts, how, how long is it going to go on before it is finally over again? And those are some of the big challenges that um, people are faced with trying to understand uh, the processes of, of volcanic eruptions and tying it, tying it to hazard assessment. So on the left there, you see a lava flow um, just going through, um, through some barrier. I mean, it, the lava flow really doesn't care, right? It just goes anywhere it wants to. Here's an eruption of Pinatubo 91, famous eruption, big uh, um, effect on the climate. But this is a Plinian eruption, one of the uh, you know, largest that we have been able to observe in recent decades. <clears throat> and so this Plinian eruption, you know, ash and gas goes up into the sky, <clears throat> maybe 20 kilometers high. And at some point, this stuff is gonna come back down. So down here, you see the cow here as a scale, but you can see the mountain range and you don't really see the volcano. It's all covered uh, in this massive um, ash cloud. <clears throat> and so that ash is going to come down, it's gonna rain down and uh, cover, cover the landscape. Kind of like snow but the thing is snow will melt once it gets warmer the ash is just going to stick around or get remobilized now more significantly these um, eruption columns can collapse in a rather dramatic fashion and produce produce what we call these pyroclastic flows or pyroclastic density currents that are a mixture of ash and gas and uh, those can travel at relatively fast speeds you know, perhaps uh, up to maybe 100 kilometers an hour or so. And those, of course, are extremely devastating um, hazards from volcanic eruptions. <clears throat> now, uh, going back to uh, specifically going back to Central, Amer uh, C Central America and South America in particular, um, the, talking about Lajars next is, is, really, um, is really important. Because lahars are essentially just mud flows, but they are um, due to volcanic eruptions, and they are just remobilization of material that was erupted by by some some volcanic event. And then, if you have enough rain or snow melt, you can remobilize this material and form these um, form these lahars. And here's a picture of Armero in Colombia, 1985. And uh, this was a really, really devastating uh, 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 disaster because um, it killed 25,000 people. And uh, the, the volcano is Nevado del Ruiz. It's a glaciated volcano. And um, a very small, relatively small eruption happened in 85. And 
the eruption just um, melted part of the glacier and the glacier, you know, the meltwater uh, remobilized a bunch of the ash and materials that were already on that very, very steep volcano. And so <clears throat> the volcano is very steep, very large. And so this, these debris flows, these lahars just ran down these riverbeds uh, and, um, and just uh, inundated the, the town of Armero, right? And uh, you know, 25,000 people out of uh, 29,000 people were killed in, back in uh, 1985 due to this very small eruption. And this is really, really devastating um, because there was only you know, 15 minutes between the eruption and the Lahar arriving in Armero there was um, a not, not very good communication between the scientists and the officials. And so the, the, the locals were told to stay inside their houses to avoid ashfall, but they were not aware of the, uh, the hard danger. Although, you know, um, I don't know if I can go back, but if you just look at the map, you can see that all the riverbeds, you know, they, they funnel down into Armero. So if there's anything coming down from the volcano, it's going to end up in our marrow. So it was very easy in a, in a sense to, to um, you know, predict this, but the communication didn't, didn't work. And so the, the folks in that village um, stayed inside rather than running up uh, slopes uh, to, to get to higher ground, right? So they would have just had to go up these slopes and, um, and they would have been okay. So, <clears throat> Large, large damage. And this uh, 1985 was really an important year. It really woke people up and um, thought, hey, we really have to do something um, about, about these hazards and, and better, better communicating the hazards and um, you know, studying those hazards. Right. So on the other hand, uh, volcanoes provide very, very fertile soil. So you know, lots of the coffee um, that you might drink around the world that comes from Central America or South America, mostly Central America, and also yeah, Colombia, um, you know, is grown on the flanks of volcanoes. For example, here, Poas, we'll get back to Poas in Costa Rica in a, in a few minutes. And um, so what I want to say is that um, I want to focus a little bit on Colombia because that's really where I started um, studying volcanoes back in the early 90s as a master's student. And I want to focus in on Galeras volcano, which is um, the southernmost active volcano, or one of the southernmost active volcanoes in Colombia. So, uh, and I want to point out Marta Calvache, who was a um, classmate of mine at the at Arizona State University. And um, she is, um, a native Colombian, and she worked on Galeras volcano under on the, on the geology of Galeras, and uh, figured out the eruptive history of this of this volcano, and also the hazards of this volcano. And then after her PhD, she went back to Colombia and, and ran the observatory in uh, near Galeras for many many years, and um, has for the last I think ten years or maybe even fifteen years um, been uh, in Bogota very uh, very high up in the uh, geological survey of Colombia. I think she is now the director of the geological survey in Colombia. So you know, this is just to uh, illustrate that she is trained as a field uh, volcanologist. She was trained uh, collecting these samples, analyzing them, making hazard maps and uh, interpreting the history of the volcano. So uh, Galeras is a uh, <clears throat> well known in the volcanological community because um, there was an eruption in 1993. This is the crater of Galeras. And in 1993, there was a small eruption at this volcano that killed uh, six scientists, right? There was, a, there was a workshop there that in fact, my advisor, Stan Williams was leading at the time. And uh, there was a field trip going down to the volcano to sample some of these gases that you know, I'm sampling here, exactly this place over here. And a very small eruption <clears throat> killed the scientists that were um, doing measurements and collecting samples around the crater of the volcano, right? The very small eruption was kind of a freak incident. And um, 
So that's, that's uh, why Galeras is, is quite well known in the volcanological community. <clears throat> so during that time, I was just starting out um, my, uh, my master's. Uh, I was there in 93 and I, I didn't go to, to the field trip that day just out of um, sh- uh, pure luck. I went on another field trip, but uh, that, that was really the moment when I thought, well, I should really see if we can, um, if we can forecast these eruptions. And this is really kind of what I want to do. So um, in 91, I spent three months um, at Galeras Volcano for my master's thesis. And the initial plan was to collect samples at this exact fumarole twice a week. But uh, because of the eruption, um, it was just simply the activity was too high. And so I had to kind of change my uh, perspective and and the topic of my master's thesis. And so what I was kind of focusing on was this um, correlation between um, these very curious um, seismic events that are shown here. These are called tornillos for the aficionados of seismology. So these are screw, screw type events and they are very long. They, they last like 40 seconds and they have a very low frequency. They're very interesting seismic events. Um, and you know, they weren't discovered at Galeras, but at the time they were like really uh, some, something quite new. And so, so what, I, what I did was um, I just uh, used these events and, and plotted the duration of these events and, um, and compared it to the gas flux. And that's this, this ancient plot that I made, um, uh, you know, what, almost 30 years ago now, I guess. And so it's just, you know, plotting these events. And, you know, I, I used duration because uh, it seemed to be a parameter that at the time people thought had maybe something to do with the pressurization of the volcanic edifice, right? So, so in my mind, it's like, hey, you know, you have this volcano, uh, you have this magma down here, it's degassing, you have a dome that's sitting on top of it. And the eruption occurs because you have pressurization of gas under this dome. And so we need a way of understanding that and, and uh, forecasting that. So uh, I read about the seis- seismic events and they said, oh yeah, it, it, it relates to pressurization. And I thought, well, if there's pressurization, then there's no gas coming out. So then I measured the gas coming out with an ancient instrument. Um, and, and in fact, you know, there is this kind of correlation uh, when, when we have no, uh, no earthquakes like that, we have pretty high fluxes of, of this gas, 6,000 tons of sulfur dioxide a day. And then, you know, in uh, February, these gas fluxes went back down, <clears throat> down, 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 and these events started kicking in. And then an eruption happened uh, right here, an eruption, ha- uh, sorry, eruption happened right here. And then right after the eruption, the gas went back up. So the gas pressure was released and the gas came back out and uh, you know there was no no seismicity so so in hindsight it's very easy to look back and say oh yeah this is what happened right if you look at the if you look at this you can come up with a model and um, if you if you publish it in a timely manner you know journals like nature even even go for it right so but so I've always been intrigued by like trying to understand like both the seismicity and the gas and how they work together. But the problem is you see that this eruption that killed the six people uh, was, was right here. And you, you see that we have this increase in hindsight. You see that this increase happened, but before I started looking at it, nobody looked at it. And you know, the reason is, ha, this is in December and January holidays in, uh, in Colombia, right? Nobody, uh, everybody is, um, you know, getting ready for the festivities of the Christmas and, and New Year's, uh, New Year's uh, celebrations and so on. So the observatory is not very much staffed. All these events have to be analyzed by hand. No gas flux measurements have been done because you actually have to go out and drive around the volcano to make those measurements. Right. So the point is the data is very sparse. Right. And so... Um, what what we what what you see is um, simply we had to um, we had to figure out a way to collect more data and this is this is a gas ratios you know over the years one data point in eighty nine one a couple of data points in ninety a couple of data points in ninety one and then you know you may see some changes before an eruption but imagine going up to this uh, 
volcanic vent and collecting these samples in these small bottles, taking them back to the lab and analyzing them. To get around to analyzing them takes time. Right? So then we developed this, um, my advisor really developed this instrument um, that is supposed to uh, measure gases continuously. And he called it the black box. And I think it, it didn't really catch on at the time. But, um, but he was one of the, he was really the first to, to uh, put together like some sensors in a box and just stick it on a volcano and, and record things. And here we're testing this at this exactly same fumarole uh, at Galera's volcano a few years later. I think this was probably 96, 97 or something like that. So um, yeah, Central America is really a fantastic um, laboratory uh, for testing instrumentation. And uh, that's mainly because there are so many people um, in Nicaragua, Costa Rica, uh, Guatemala that are working on volcanoes in these, in these institutions and universities, right? So since the 70s, really, people have advanced um, instrumentation, uh, especially for gas measurements at volcanoes. And so here is an example of Masaya uh, Lava Lake, uh, when my student and I went there a few years ago, and what you see is, you know, this is lava at the surface. It's just down, down in this little hole, in this hole, uh, I don't know, maybe 20, 30 meters down. And um, the lava is just moving really, really fast. And as you can see, the gas is just coming out of that, um, that lava. So what that tells us is, you know, the, the magma is, or the lava is degassing continuously, it's continuously moving, and uh, the gases that reach the surface is something that we can analyze and sample, yet you can't analyze this lava down there. It's just impossible to get a sample from that. So, um, so uh, because of the importance of the gas emissions and how they could potentially be used for, um, uh, forecasting volcanic activity, there has been a big push um, since like 2014 or so by, um, by a group called the Novak group out of Sweden to instrument a number of volcanoes with continuous gas measurements. And, and what you can see, and this is important for this talk, is that so many of these sites are in Latin America, right? And that really has to do with the fact that there's a lot of really fantastic support from the local observatories that are uh, participating in these, in these experiments. So these are now continuous gas measurements rather than having to go out, make a measurement once a day or once every few days or once a week, these instruments, they continuously measure the sulfur dioxide emissions from, from all of these volcanoes. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about Villarica later on, and I'm going to talk a little bit about Turialba a little bit later on as well. So here's just uh, the kinds of data that you can get. This is Masaya, and uh, this is two years of data, right? And <clears throat> of course there are large uh, error bars and so on, but we can get an SO2 emission rate ve at very, very high frequency and for a long, long, long time period with some gaps because instruments might not work or conditions aren't right, but you can now get all this data continuously and that has really um, revolutionized the way we can look at volcanic processes. So now uh, this is kind of a technical part and I'll go through it um, rather quickly. If we have, um, and, and some of my students I think, or some, uh, yeah, some of my students are on, online here, they know this and I've shown this many times, but if you, if you have a gas uh, or if you have a melt that is at high pressure, let's say 30 kilometers depth, and uh, that melt has gas dissolved in it, carbon and sulfur. And um, you know, at some depth, that carbon to sulfur ratio might be one, okay? So the molar ratio of CO2 to SO2 could be like one, for example. And as that melt rises to the surface, that carbon to sulfur ratio in the melt will change uh, because the solubility of these two gases are so different. So the CO2 is less soluble. So as the melt rises up to the surface, the CO2 will just so bubble high. out more than, uh, than the SO2, right? So the melt gas composition is gonna change. And likewise, 
if you sample the fluid, the gas, it'll mimic that same process. Okay, so the gas that comes off is going to be more CO2 rich, but as that magma degasses or rises to shallower levels, it will, uh, the gas that comes off um, the volcano will mimic that process. So the carbon to sulfur ratio is going to change uh, because of that difference in sol solubility. So, so this is kind of the schematic idea. And so in, in essence, volcanic gases are the only direct and real-time chemical probe of magma at depth. So we can, we can analyze the gases that come off the magma and, and we can learn something about the magma. Seismology tells us about the physical, our physical probes, but the gases are really chemical probes. So uh, in recent years, these you know, black boxes um, that you know, we, we had in a very crude way in the mid-90s on uh, Galeras were really uh, advanced, were really developed um, by mainly Italian and Japanese researchers. And so in 2005, uh, some pretty sophisticated such boxes have been developed. And then over the years, and especially um, through this deep carbon observatory program, uh, have been placed in a bunch of volcanoes around the world. So you have this box here that has just sucking in the gas and analyzing it. And then you get the data sent by telemetry satellite or a sat phone or whatever. Uh, down to the observatory. So you get continuous data as long as your instrument's working. Let's see. Uh, next slide. Okay. So I'm going to show some example, uh, one example from Villarica. This is, uh, so Chile is here, Santiago, Villarica is pretty far down. Villarica has an active lava lake inside. And uh, in November 2014, it looked like this. And in February, March 2015, eruption happened. And so um, we have uh, some gas data. Here's your CO2-SO2 ratio. And here we see some data points, again, collected by people going up to the volcano, climbing up to Villarica, collecting a sample once in a while. And the ratio is about one. And then uh, with the um, installation of the multi-gas system, right around uh, you know, mid-2014, we have gotten this amazing data set where you have, uh, again, a low ratio, and then the ratio goes up from about one to two to about 10 right prior to the eruption. <clears throat> and so that, uh, again, signals the, um, the arrival of, of new magma that then caused this kind of eruption. And then, of course, after the eruption or during the eruption, instrument is destroyed, so you have no more data, but at least you had this, this ramp up of carbon to sulfur ratio prior to the eruption, you know, you have a few weeks uh, in advance where you can say, hey, the volcano might be doing something, new magma is coming up. Impossible to do that if you only have a few data points, right? You might, um, you might not trust your, your data if you only have one point up here, okay? So um, now if we go to uh, Costa Rica, another fantastic place to study active volcanoes, there's Poas, there's Torrealba, Arenal. This is Arenal here. And um, Poas volcano is really interesting. It has an, uh, a lake inside. So this is an acid crater lake, has very low pH, has high temperature. And here's a fumarole field that's on the side of the, of the crater lake. Here's a student and myself sampling these fumaroles um, back, uh, boy, sometime uh, uh, a few years ago, I guess. So if we think about um, the carbon sulfur ratio at, at POAS, we can think about having a baseline uh, of a ratio that is you know, around one. That's kind of a typical ratio one or two or something for these volcanoes. And then uh, what we observe is an increase in this ratio. And uh, so that increase in the ratio uh, in the case of POAS uh, indicates that you have you know, both SO2 and CO2 coming off the magma, but you have this lake up there, right? So you have this crater lake and that crater lake loves sulfur dioxide. So it just absorbs the sulfur dioxide making sulfuric acid that gives the acidity to the lake. So over time, if that process just continues, you would continuously suck out the uh, sulfur dioxide and the carbon to sulfur ratio will just go up. 
So then, however, uh, if you have a drop in that ratio, <clears throat> then that might indicate that this lake is uh, saturated with sulfur dioxide or that the input of sulfur dioxide from the magma is so massive that the lake cannot absorb it anymore. And that could be because you get new magmatic injection of material uh, in, into, the, into the volcanic system. So... Looks like we may have lost Dr. Fisher, but hopefully log on here soon. Does anyone in the audience have his uh, phone number to be able to text him? This happened to me in a talk a week and a half ago where if you're in presenter view, you can't see necessarily see that you lost the connection. So I don't know if there's anyone here who can who can text him and let him know or call him. I can send him an email at the very least. Okay. I can run up to his office. Oh, better yet. Thank you. And it looks like um
Hi. I, I went and got him. Hi. I can't see myself, but hello. Can oh, I hear Shoot. Anyway, uh, my computer just totally crashed. And so, uh, can we hear? I hope uh, it's not a computer you need for your, your trip tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, so it totally crashed. I don't know what happened. It just like totally like stopped and it says it has no power. Oh no. But I have, have it plugged in, so I can't, um, I can't get back. So anyway, um, what I was gonna say is uh, that we were just able to um, use these gas ratios to uh, forecast these eruptions at several different places. And um, you know, I was showing Poas, but you know, other examples like Turrialba as well as um, you know, Villa Rica, the one that I showed. So, so we've just been uh, using these um, techniques to better understand the processes leading to eruptions. And then I was going to end with talking about Uturungu volcano in Bolivia because that's a very interesting place uh, because it hasn't erupted in 200,000 years, but it's deforming um, very, very significantly. So people are trying to understand, you know, why is it deforming? Uh, is it going to become active? Um, you know, and so we have started a program of sampling gases there and so on. But because of the pandemic, we haven't been back since uh, couple of years, three years now. So. so that's it. Are there any questions? Thank you, Tobias. Yeah, sorry about the technical uh, difficulty. No, I, I feel terrible for you. I had I had the same experience a couple of weeks ago. I was giving a talk and my my computer died. Really? Um, yeah, it was a huh. yeah, it was a national talk. Oh yeah. my gosh! Yeah, I never yeah. had this. I never had this problem before. I mean, yeah, I've given so many talks and lectures online. Yeah, never happened. I, I did want to ask you about about Via Rica because it sounds like you were you know already collecting data there. So was there time then to warn the the local population or or how did how did that work in terms of you know yeah. notifying people? Um, not really. It was okay. um, it was too short, and um, it was yeah. It, but but the volcano had become quite active anyway, and so you know I didn't collect those data. Those were um, from a colleague of mine, Sandra Ayupa. But you know they were in, in touch with the observatory and so on. But I don't think that they uh, specifically used that data. Um, to, um, to warn them because at that time, uh, the carbon sulfur ratio approach wasn't really as well established as it is now. Okay. So, so the Arica was like one of the earliest ones besides you know, Etna, but, um, but at that time it wasn't as well established as it is now. Nowadays for POAS, for example, in Curialba, that's what the observatory relies on the most. Is, is that issue. Do people evacuate when they're told to evacuate? Yeah, so at Poas is a big uh, tourist destination and um, it's in a national park. So what they do is they close the park. Okay. If, if that ratio goes up, you know, then they, in fact, uh, you know, issue some warnings and they close the park for tourists. And usually the eruption happens um, a few days afterwards. And then they open can open the park again if everything goes goes well, right? It's not it's not a hundred percent, but it's it's pretty pretty solid forecasting method. But it's a small eruption, so you don't really have to evacuate. Um, but at least you can stop the tourists from going. Thank you. Mm. Any other folks have questions? I was just also really impressed by the way that the technology has, has advanced and how much, you know, with the 
continuous collection of data and being able to tr continuously transmit it, um, which I guess you've seen over your career, right? That, it, that when you started, there was nothing like that. And, uh, right. Yeah, I mean, technology is really driving a lot of the, the science and you know, the, the measurements we can make is uh, just so much more, you know, uh, so much more sophisticated now, these measurements. So how, how good though are, are, is the communication between the different, you know, organizations that are collecting the data and then the organizations that are responsible for, you know, disaster management or disaster prevention? And does, yeah, I guess that, it must vary by country. Are there, country. are there better examples? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, it really varies by, by country. I think Costa Rica, it works really well. Um, and, uh, you know, Nicaragua works pretty well. So I think, I think it, it varies. Uh, but in general, you know, these, these groups are very well, um, like, dialed in, right? Because they've been monitoring these volcanoes for, for so long. Um, case like Amero and Nevada de Ruiz in the mid 80s, that was really a disastrous example where you know the scientists were warning about lahars, but the mayor of the city didn't didn't want to uh, tell people to evacuate. You know? um, so so there are these these really terrible examples, but I think they're getting much more rare. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the communication in general is pretty good. It's like with you know Kilauea. I mean, there was yeah. good, good communication uh, between you know, the observatory and, and the landowners. Although there's still people building houses where yeah yeah in yeah. super vulnerable locations. Yeah, and uh, that's always going to happen. Yeah. Um, yeah. I have a question. Yeah. Um, so that CO2 to SO2 ratio, you were saying there's like a background amount that's basically one for a lot of the uh -huh. volcanoes. Yeah. After an eruption, does that background rate ever kind of get reset? Yeah. And so I was going to show that data set for uh, OAS volcano, where you have this uh, increase over time, and then it goes back down to the close to the magmatic value, but it doesn't go all the way back, mm -hmm. right? So it actually ends up being higher, and it has been higher and higher uh, for years now since that eruption, right? So it doesn't necessarily go all the way back, but, but you know, we need um, long-term data to really assess it, right? In general, it, it goes back close to where Mm -hmm. But in the case of POAS, it, it doesn't. And then the question is, you know, why doesn't it go back to, to one or two or three? Uh, why does it stay high? Um, could be that the hydrothermal system has some has deepened and reorganized, just reorganized yeah. and is able to absorb more sulfur. So there's a lot of processes that can happen. We don't understand. So, yeah. She's not like that. You're muted, I think. There. Thank you so much, Tobias. Yeah, so sure. Appreciate you you're doing this. Um, sure. Yeah. Yeah, it was fun. I don't, if people want, I, if people want. You can also turn on your cameras if you wanna. If you wanna do that or not. <laughs> so. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. So yes, thanks, thank you, and have a have a a, a great trip tomorrow. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Bye bye.